is one of the most important jobs of the sappers. The rate of the advance of an army will often depend on the speed with which its sappers can erect bridges. To enable heavy traffic to cross rivers, the service pontoon equipment is used. This equipment is fully mobile and can be rapidly erected if troops are practiced in its use. We're now going to see how to construct rafts, the floating part of the bridge, and how they are handled and connected to form a bridge. This is a class 24 bridge and is made with ordinary three pier rafts. The standard raft carries 21 feet 4 inches of 9 feet 9 inch roadway. Let's see how it's made. The materials used in its construction are pontoon, plain road bearer, button road bearer, chess or decking plank, ribboned, racking bolt, and raft connector. The stores for the three pier raft are carried on special pontoon lorries each of which takes two pontoons and one-third of the raft superstructure, so that three pontoon lorries are required for one raft. The lorries are driven to the offloading site, which is placed as close to the building site as possible, and should be marked out with tape. Now here's a suggested organization for offloading. For clearness, no attempt has been made to obtain cover. The offloading party is divided into three squads. The first squad, one NCO and four men, prepare each lorry in turn for offloading. This squad unfastens the clamps which hold the superstructure, road bearers, ribbons, chesses, etc., in place. The first to come off is the holder for the road bearers. Then the small clamp holding down the anchors. Next, the door to the compartment holding oars and chesses is undone. Meanwhile, the quick releases of the chains holding down each of the pontoons are removed. The squad then winds up the top pontoon clear of the bottom one by means of four built-in winches which clip to the handrail of the pontoon. It's important that the winches are always wound evenly in order to keep the pontoon level. The second squad of about 12 men now start while the first squad move on to prepare the second lorry. All movement goes on at the double. The job of the second squad is to remove all superstructure. They take out the anchors, oars and boat hooks from the chest compartment followed by the ribbons and road bearers. Raft connectors are taken off the side of the lorry, followed by chesses from the chess compartment. Boys, breast lines and racking bolts come from the locker in the near side of the lorry. Notice that a die is set in right-hand corner of the frame. This is for repairing the threads of the racking bolts. The only stores left on the first lorry are the pontoons, which are unloaded by the third squad, while the second squad moves on to the next lorry. The third squad consists of an NCO and 20 men. The minimum required to carry a pontoon is 18 men. They first remove the lower pontoon. This rests on rollers and is free to move. Working together, they slide it out, lift it clear, Lower it gently to the ground. Then lift and carry it away to the launching site. The party returns and four men wind down the top pontoon onto the rollers, taking care to keep it level. It's unhooked from the winches and unloaded in the same way as the first. There's no hard and fast procedure for unloading stores, as so much depends on the site and conditions, but a good organization is essential. Otherwise, when building a large bridge, there'll be complete confusion. Anchor cables are carried in a well and cannot be unloaded until the pontoons are off. The other two lorries are unloaded in the same way and then driven to the parking site. Now see how the stores have been laid out ready for construction. It's of the utmost importance that stores should be laid out neatly, as near as possible to the water and in the order in which they are required, especially for work at night. The pontoons must now be examined to see that all draining plugs are screwed well home and that there are no holes. We're now ready to build a raft. 
The minimum party required is one or two NCOs and 18 men. The breast line is attached to the ring at the bow of each pontoon with a fisherman's bend and coiled on deck ready for use. The pontoons are then launched. All this may be done as each pontoon is unloaded. This is how they should not be launched. The men aren't working together. They're not lifting the pontoon but are dragging it. This may damage the bottom which is only made of thin wood. Also, when they push it out into the stream, no one has hold of the breast line. So goodbye, pontoon. Now then, let's see how it should be done. Before carrying anything, the party must be sized. It then works under the command of the NCO. Prepare to lift. Lift. Forward. The men have straightened their backs, so getting more strength into the lift and carry and keeping the pontoon well off the ground. They're in step, so there's no stumbling. To rest, they lower the pontoon gently to the ground, take a fresh grip and carry on. To launch it, the front man takes the breast line and peels off, the remaining men peeling off as they reach the water. The pontoon is then brought in shore by the breast line man. The next step is to form a pier. Two pontoons are joined by couplers, two on deck and two on the sides. The deck couplers are closed first, then the side ones. The handle on the side must be pushed right down until the retaining catches are on top, like this. Otherwise, they may work loose under load. It only remains to open the four covers over the trunnion nuts on the deck and the pier is complete. A second pier is made in the same way and is brought alongside the first. See how the breast lines are coiled ready for casting? This must always be done. Whenever a breast line is finished with, it must be coiled down ready for use. It may be wanted in a hurry. The breast lines from both piers are passed to two breast line men, one up and one downstream. Their job is to control the piers and prevent them from grounding. In a strong stream, they may need pickets in the ground to make the lines fast. Six chesses are carried up. These are used at this stage as ramps to enable the road bearers and remaining chesses to be carried onto the raft easily. Twelve men are now detailed to carry three of the road bearers, two button and one plain, onto the pier. Notice, by the way, that all spare men fall in ready to be detailed for other jobs. This should be done automatically. Each road bearer is a four-man load. Dowels on the ends are fitted into slots along the gunwale of the offshore pier. The two button road bearers into the outside slots, the plain one into the middle. When that's done, one man sits on the end of each road bearer to keep it down, and the remaining three go ashore, erecting the stiffening catches as they go. The stiffening catches keep the raft square during building. The three men on the shore end of each road bearer now lift and push out together until the inshore dowels of the road bearers drop into their slots in the inshore gunwale. The plain road bearer is then turned over on its flat so that it can be used as a bridge along which the remaining road bearers can be slid. All now go ashore except two men. The remaining road bearers are carried up. To do this, men should automatically form themselves into fours and size themselves. The rear man gives the commands. If the men are not sized, carrying is more difficult, as you see here. One man is carrying no weight at all. The others look very graceful about their knees and their footwork is excellent, but they'll soon get tired. The road bearers are slid out in turn over the road bearer on its flat. One of the men on the offshore pier takes charge and directs each road bearer alternately up and down the stream. Notice that the slot next to the button road bearer is left free. It's only used for half floating bays. Altogether, ten road bearers are carried up, two button and eight plain. When the last one is slid out, the center ramp can be taken away. 
and the center road bearer can be lifted into its slot. The two men from the offshore pier now move to the inshore pier and stand by to receive the chassis. Twenty-six of these are needed to complete the raft. There are one-man load and must be carried correctly with the rear end down, the left hand being on top. The two chess takers place the chesses as they move backward along the road bearers, and a continued stream is kept going, up the right hand ramp and down the left. The chesses are kept in place by the buttons on the button road bearers. What happens if you carry the chesses wrongly? If a chess is carried with the rear high, on swinging round, the man behind is going to get wet. His comrades are obviously upset by the accident and rush to his assistance. Or do they? At night time or in a swift stream, this might make the party permanently one man short. Decking down is completed by using the chesses from the ramps. Then the two ribbons are brought on. These are painted khaki one side and white the other. They must be used with the khaki side out. They're positioned by pins which fit into the holes of the second chest from each end. Twelve racking bolts are brought up. These are used to secure the superstructure to the pontoons. They pass through holes in the ribbon and screw into the trunnion nuts in the decks of the piers. Four racking bolts are left on the roadway until the third pier comes into place. This third pier has meanwhile been coupled up and is now brought in. In order to weigh it down sufficiently for it to pass under the roadway, the weight of about 12 men is needed. They stand on it, and by lifting on the roadway, the pier can be walked under it. Mind your toes. The gunnels should be in line with the white marks on the button road bearer, so that the trunnion nuts are underneath the racking bolt holes in the ribbons. As soon as possible, the stiffening catches are raised, and the remaining racking bolts dropped in and made fast. Remember that the covers over the trunnion nuts on the deck of the pier must be opened as soon as the pontoons are fastened together into pier. Eight men now bring up two raft connectors, each of which is a four-man load. These are carried onto the raft and fixed to the offshore ends of the ribbons. To do this, the end racking bolt is taken out and the connector folded up. It can then be lifted onto the ribbon. The locking catch on the end of the arm fits into a slot in the ribbon and is locked with a half turn. The dowel in the ribbon must fit into the slot on the connector. The racking bolt is then put back and tightened up. Two tank guides are now brought on. These are used to keep tanks straight on the bridge and prevent them from riding up over the ribbons. They are held in place by projections which fit under the inner four racking bolts. These racking bolts are now screwed down as tight as possible. Anchors, cables, boys and boy lines are made up and placed on each pier ready for casting. Finally, oars and boat hooks are put aboard and the raft is complete, ready to go into bridge. With a good squad, this raft can be built in about 15 minutes in daylight. The short raft is constructed from two piers and takes class 24 loads. It is 13 feet 2 overall and is used in a bridge to span awkward gaps. The short raft requires special short road bearers and short ribbons. The remaining stores are the same as for the three pier raft and it is built in exactly the same way. Here is a raft being brought into bridge. It's rowed upstream past the bridge with the upstream anchors ready to cast. The line on which they are to be cast is marked by those two poles on the bank called banderoles. The distance of these from the bridge should be ten times the depth of water with a minimum of 15 fathoms or 90 feet. The anchors are cast overboard together followed by the boys on the order of the raft commander.
The rod then moves downstream, paying out on the upstream cables. It will be necessary to bend on the ends of the downstream cables to give enough length. The downstream anchors are cast in the same way when in line with the band rolls. Then, by taking in on the upstream cables, the raft is brought into bridge. The cables must always be kept under a bollard, so they can be made fast quickly. The raft is then brought alongside the bridge and connected. The upright arm of the connector is released, lowered, the locking handle locked, and the racking bolt screwed tight. The top strut is then lowered into place. All cables can now be taken in and made fast to the bollards with a round turn and figure of eight. Here, a cable is used on each pier, but in the slow stream, one cable upstream and downstream for each raft may be enough. If river traffic is expected when a bridge is complete, forming cut must be practiced. A squad must be ready which knows its job and can do it quickly. They're open. The top strut of a connector is important. It should never be detached as it's not interchangeable. It acts as a buffer and limits the movement between rafts. If it's left out, as here, movement is excessive and piers will be swamped. With the top strut in place, the articulating action is limited and the load distributed to both rafts. If the center piers are left out, time and equipment will be saved, but the bridge will only take class 18 loads. Construction remains exactly the same. When forming class 24 bridge in rough weather, it may be better to add the third pier to the raft after it's been rowed into bridge, as without it, rowing is easier. Remember, Conditions of wind and tide may make handling rafts difficult, so watermanship is essential and must be practiced. You've seen how rafts are made and used. They are the foundations of a bridge on which the movement of an army may depend. It's up to you.